Hey everybody, John Pasquini here, and this is just another quick podcast. I'm still trying to finish up my documentary, Information Ghetto, which covers the history of the evolution of what we call the mainstream media and what we call the establishment today, where these institutions came from, how they got out of control, and some suggestions on what we may be able to do to get them back under control. But uh, meanwhile, I'm a big fan of Styx Hexenhammer 666. He's got a really interesting YouTube channel, and I check in with it every once in a while to see what he's up to, because he has some pretty well-thought-out opinions generally. He put out a new video today, I think, called uh, Why Anarchism Will Always Fail. And as usual, it was some really good food for thought, although in this case, I think usually Styx and I see eye to eye. But in this case, I think that he has some faulty reasoning and some misunderstandings of human nature and history. So... I'm going to go ahead and give you a brief overview of what he said, and there will be a link to the entire video in the description. I highly recommend that you check it out. Uh, if you don't know him, it's a pretty interesting YouTube channel. If you like my stuff, you might enjoy it. So he starts off by saying that he believes that anarchy is fundamentally unstable, and it's because when you can only organize humans voluntarily, they form groups that are too small and that they become tribal and they can't build infrastructure for mass production or mass transportation. So really he's saying that anarchy, you can't build a big functioning society the way that we think of it today. You couldn't have something as complicated and as, uh, uh, and as efficient as the production systems that we have in the United States if you were in anarchy. He also says that uh, without a central organizing force in society, we will have a power vacuum. So anarchy will either become mob rule or a strong man as people try and fill this power vacuum. And that ultimately the reasons for this are biological. He then goes on to describe the archaeological finds around some primordial city, city state that he's aware of. And um, that was really cool. I actually wasn't aware of that stuff. But he extrapolates from that some evidence that he says proves that they must have had a vaguely individualistic but sort of statist kind of organization to their society. And I don't, I'm not sure if I can confirm or verify that, but it was pretty cool. Um, he then goes on to say that man's general tendency is toward more order, and that this is his evolutionary tendency, that this is a natural trait built into mankind from evolution. Uh, he then goes on to advocate minarchy. Um, he wants a limited government for efficiency, basically. And he says that we don't have that now, but it's not because our government is dysfunctional, uh, it's because our government is dysfunctional. It's not because the concept of government is itself inherently dysfunctional. And so those are some interesting points. So now I'll give you my take on it. And first of all, uh, I agree with Styx that the origin of statism is biological, but I can go, I think, into some more detail about where that comes from. Human beings are pack mammals, like wolves or dogs. This is why dogs get along with people so well because dogs have an inherent kind of pack social structure and dogs can fit into a human household, a human family, in a similar way to the way they would fit into their pack. Ideally, you, the human owner, is going to be the pack leader who's bossing the dogs around, although I've met some families where that isn't always necessarily the case. Sometimes the dog becomes alpha. So that's interesting, isn't it? Among dogs, uh, if there is nobody in the house who has taken command, if there's nobody in the house who is alpha to the dog, nobody that the dog can look up to, different dogs react to this in different ways. Some dogs try to become the alpha themselves, and that's kind of the most obvious thing to me. I think that's what I'd do if I was in a situation like that. Other dogs don't do that, though. Some dogs, when there's no alpha, they become nervous and upset, and they will sometimes lash out at their owners, but not, in a, not because they're trying to seek dominance, it's because they're nervous, they're afraid. They have this built-in biological unease that comes from not having an alpha to look up to. And we can learn from human nature about this, because humans are closely related to dogs, and primates follow these same kind of hierarchies. There are alpha chimps, and so on. And there are alpha people too. And I'm, I don't mean this in the sense of alpha and beta that like you hear in on the red pill uh, forum and, and things like that. I'm not talking about alpha and beta as in the pickup artist community, although those terms sort of apply here, but this is something different. In this case, what I mean are leaders and followers. Maybe that works better than alpha and beta. But um, I know that this is an overgeneralization, but in general, you can divide people up into categories like that. 
leader and follower. And uh, everybody really exists on a range, but just bear with me. So how do we get from this innate biological tendency to be anxious and nervous without having somebody to look up to in a leadership position and the existence of nation states? The science of mimetics gives us a bridge from the biology to the ideology. Uh, if you're unaware of mimetics, it is the science of how ideas grow and spread, and it applies concepts from evolutionary biology because uh, natural selection is an algorithm and it doesn't just apply to biological organisms reproducing. It applies to anything where you have a copy where the copy isn't made with perfect fidelity. Uh, wherever you have objects that replicate, the objects that are best at replicating will replicate the most. And so the human brain is the environment for ideas, and ideas will spread from people to people based on how memorable they are, how catchy they are. So it's the ideas that, sp that are catchy, the ideas that are memorable, that spread, not necessarily the good ideas or the useful ideas. And so you can think of how some of the songs that you like and or some of the songs that you remember aren't necessarily songs that you like. Sometimes you get a song that you hate stuck in your head. That's because natural selection is amoral. It doesn't have to be a good song for you to remember it. It just has to be memorable. It just has to be catchy to get stuck in your head. And so all ideas actually work like that because songs are forms of memes. Uh, songs also spread virally through the same kind of concepts as, as you find in natural selection. So going viral is a very apt metaphor. And you can learn more about things like this from my upcoming book, Mimetic Warfare, which unfortunately isn't ready yet, but hopefully someday. But in any case, back to the lecture at hand. The next thing we need to look at is religion, because religion provides a useful example of mimetics. I think that's actually how many people who know about mimetics learned about it because the new atheists use it constantly as a stick to bash religion with. That's how I first encountered these concepts. I read Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, and then uh, Dan Dennett's Breaking the Spell. That was kind of my introduction to mimetics. And one of the things that, that you can understand is that ideas become catchy because of human emotional states. And so religion gives you kind of an obvious one, right? Religion exploits the fear of death. One of the ways that religion can reproduce into a fresh human brain is when somebody is afraid to die, the idea of heaven can be extremely comforting. And there are some people, I've met some, who only really embrace a religion because they're afraid of death. They don't, wanna, they don't want to accept the idea that someday they will cease to exist, that their relatives will cease to exist, etc. And so it's not that hard to see how religious ideas, religious memes, evolved to exploit that fear. In the same way that Animals evolved to exploit natural resources in the environment. So now let's go back to statism. Statism is similar to religion in that it evolved over time. And statism exploits both the alpha and beta tendencies in humans. The beta desire is pretty obvious. There's a lot of people out there who are afraid to think for themselves and who are comforted by the idea that there's somebody out there who's going to take care of the problems for you. <laughs> and, well, first of all, let me say that I'm not saying that everybody who's a statist is a follower or everybody who's a statist is a beta or that sticks is a beta. No, it's nothing like that. It's just that these ideologies evolve to exploit those emotions. And the state also exploits the emotions of the alphas. And that's maybe a little bit less obvious, but... Politicians are essentially drug addicts, and, and by politicians, I mean the rulers, anybody, anybody in a leadership position in, a, in the government. So you could have, I'm talking about the king, the House of Lords, the president, the prime minister, because people are rewarded with an endorphin rush when they move up in a social hierarchy. You get the same kind of happy high, the same rush of happy feeling chemicals in your brain from having power over somebody that you get from having sex or from gambling or from doing heroin because it's these chemicals that, that are released in your brain that you become addicted to. You don't actually become addicted to the drug itself. You are addicted to the happy chemicals that it puts in your brain. So think of the way that a drug addict or a compulsive gambler can destroy the finances of a small family. 
And it happens because they are so obsessed with the drug that they lose their empathy for their family. The, the only thing that matters to them is getting that rush of happy chemicals. And so politicians are exactly the same. And the state exploits that. The state gives more power than you could ever get through any other kind of structure. The state gives you the power to have the moral authority to beat the shit out of and kill people who disagree with you. It doesn't get much better than that. And so you get this competition. You have, it is incentivized. There is a competition among the biggest assholes, the, the liars, the cheaters, to take these positions of power. In, in the, they can't resist it. They're just drawn to it like moths to a flame. So what you end up with here is a very self-destructive feedback loop between these two groups of people. <laughs> what you get is the average status, the everyday schlub, who thinks that they need the state above them because they are addicted to the comfort that they get from the false sense of security of believing that there's somebody above them who's going to solve all their problems for them. And on the other end, you have the alpha statists, the actual political rulers who are addicted to having power over everyday schlubs and anybody else that they can beat down. And betas can't even really imagine a world that doesn't have statist solutions to problems. Think of, have you ever suggested privatizing public education to a liberal? It's not just that they disagree with you. They think that they're crazy. They can't even imagine it. But public education hasn't been around forever. It's not an innate part of humankind. Public education has only been around for what, like 150, 200 years, if that? Well, there may be a biological component to that. Some aspect of it may be genetic. I know that some breeds of dogs are bred for their passivity or for their good personalities. And maybe you could do the same thing with people if you wanted to run a human breeding experiment. I don't know. But when you put mimetic evolution on top of these personality traits in humans... Statist ideologies are ultimately what you get. Ultimately, statist ideologies boil down to rationalizations for the use of violence. Why is it okay to use violence in a monarchy? Well, it's because the king has the divine right to have power over you. You have to do what he says. Eventually, that ran out of steam. So what's the justification for the state in a democracy? A majority of the people, the will of the people have decided. And I think it's fairly obvious that both of those are rationalizations. I doubt anybody listening to this would accept monarchy, but let's attack democracy. Why do half of my neighbors voting on something put a requirement on me, ethically and morally? It doesn't. <laughs> it's just a rationalization. So what is the justification for the use of force in a monarchy? The only one that I've heard is utilitarian. We need a state because we just need one to solve all these problems. And that's pretty much the argument that Sticks makes here. So let us now, that brings us to the topic of stability. <laughs> Are nation states stable? Well, they don't last forever. Civilizations rise and fall. There are entire civilizations that are gone. There are entire countries that are gone. And while the exact cause of this is not well understood or well known, states clearly decay over time. Civilizations decay over time. And that shouldn't surprise you. Pretty much everything, entropy is a natural part of the universe. Pretty much everything is going to break down and decline over time. And human institutions are certainly no exception to that rule. Um, and so what you get here are government solutions to problems are always miserable failures. Because ultimately, they're run by drug addicts. And the check on the power of the drug addicts are hapless betas who can't make decisions for themselves. And so what you get over time are institutions that bloat out of control and cannibalize the rest of society. So think of the welfare state, social security, the war on drugs. None of these things actually work. Within a couple of generations, these programs were out of money and revealed the corruption and graft and incompetence that can only come in the, in the government. So does your minarchy have a standing army? Does your minarchy have an intelligence agency? Well, sit back and watch those institutions blow it out of control and eat the rest of society. <laughs> Status solutions are kind of like when doctors didn't know anything about anatomy or germ theory. And so they used to just cut their patients and bleed them in an attempt to solve health problems. And every once in a while, the patient would get better. And so they thought that maybe that was a, uh, a functional technique. And so whenever you got a patient where it wasn't working... They would just continue to bleed them, and eventually, every once in a while, you'd have patients that would just bleed to death. And again, that happens because the beta statists just don't have the imagination 
to see that these institutions can fail and are failing, and they don't have the imagination to see any kind of alternative. So Sticks then recommends privatizing most of what the United States government does. Well, you'd need a war for that. You would probably need a war for that, because the rulers, the people in charge, are drug addicts, and they're not going to give up their fix unless you take it away with force. Just the way it works. And tragically, the United States is an example of this. The United States was, in essence, a minarchy when it first started out, and it metastasized into one of the largest and most evil and destructive and intrusive and corrupt and incompetent states that ever existed. So, um, why did that happen? It, well, it's because people vote for more power and for the government in response to every crisis real and imagined. So even if you could take the United States back down to a minarchy, that whole process is just going to start over again. So ultimately, Sticks' position boils down to the same position that all statists ultimately hold. And that is that, well, statism is going to work. We just haven't found the right structure yet, or we haven't got the right people in charge with that. And well, okay, good luck with that. <laughs> We've been trying for, what, 2,600 years? But uh, I will say that Sticks is right about anarchy creating a power vacuum in the present. Anarchy isn't something that we could have today. And that is because there are so many people who have this innate attitude that they need the state to solve problems for them. Now, for me personally, I am hoping that this is something that is either behavioral or even if it's genetic, it's something that can be brought to heel through behavioral changes. Like everybody has behavioral urges to eat, but not everybody is overweight or not everybody has sex drive. Everybody has a sex drive, but not everybody is a nymphomaniac. And those problems generally tend to be behavioral. And there is precedent that humans can ch change their behavior at the societal level over time. And I'm going to bring up two examples. One is slavery has pretty much been eliminated within Western civilization. It, and you could probably not going to find too many people who would be willing to bring slavery back. Slavery is now on the, the, the wrong side of morality for the vast majority of people within Western civilization. I know that slavery continues elsewhere in the world, and that actually I believe that there's more slaves today than there were at any other time in human history, which is really tragic. But within Western civilization, outright, and I guess, you, I guess there's also debt slavery, but outright shoot you in the face if you won't work in the rice fields slavery isn't something that you see in western civilization anymore and that was a big change slavery was a, it seemed like it was innate even the bible rationalizes slavery the bible does not have a commandment against slavery the bible doesn't even have a general uh, moral ought against slavery what the bible does is prescribe it, it prescribes a just way of treating slaves, and it involves only beating them in a limited capacity and uh, not doing too much permanent damage, essentially. Um, but this was something that was thought to be impossible to change. People who were against slavery at first were thought of as idealists, maybe even as crazy, and there were lots of rationalizations for slavery. Like, well, you know, black people, well, remember, whites aren't, whites aren't the only people who ever enslaved anybody, but this is the example that everybody is familiar with. And so very few white people actually thought, I love owning slaves, it's awesome. Now, the way they thought was like, these are inferior people, and they're li they live as savages in the horrible desert, and, well, we can, we can bring them here, and yeah, they're going to have to pick cotton for us or whatever, but at the same time, they're going to have plenty of food and water and much more comfortable accommodations. This is almost as good for them as it is for us. You know, a lot of slave owners and, and slave people with a slave ideology, they had rationalizations like that. They, a lot of them had convinced themselves that what they were doing was right, or at least not horribly wrong. The other is the human aversion to homosexuals. This is another thing that was in pretty much every culture that seems to be innate in people, and it may be biological. It could be, there, there are some, I've heard theories, and who even knows? Um, homosexuality may be genetic, and so why would homosexuality evolve? Well, it could be a form of reproductive strategy. It could be that um, homosexuals are produced as kind of a mimic, and you see this in nature where you have uh, animals that 
disguise themselves as male or female in order to provide a broader range of mating opportunities. Like getting close to the female by pretending to be a female uh, and then having mating opportunities. I know it's I know it seems like a stretch and it's far fetched. Uh, I'm not saying this is definitely true. I'm just trying to give you an example of how the aversion to homosexuality could be genetic. It could be something that evolved because heterosexuals didn't want to get tricked in the game that way. So they evolved a defense mechanism. And we can, we've seen how in mimetics, these innate biological drives get turned into rationalizations. And so things like the Christian aversion to homosexuality probably evolved in a similar manner. And I think I forgot to mention slavery is probably could be biological as well, because we also have this innate drive to kind of dominate people. Slavery is an obvious hyperextension of that. But among the youth today in Western civilization, times have changed. And now people are much more accepting of homosexuality, which is a good thing. So we can see that people are capable of positive change. We can outthink these evolved rationalizations and become more moral. It just takes time. And so you couldn't have passed a law in, say, I don't know, the 1700s to force people to be nice to homosexuals. Would not happen. But And in, by the same token, you couldn't get rid of the state today and have an anarchic society because there are too many people who have these beta personality traits. Well, really, that doesn't matter. I'll talk about that in a second. The problem isn't that there's people who are followers. The problem is that we have these evolved ideological rationalizations for why being a follower is okay. And that is what we need to attack if we want to get rid of states, which I do. I am an anarchist. I don't acknowledge the authority of nation states, but I also acknowledge that when nation states collapse or if you take if nation states go away, you don't get anarchy. What you get is a bunch of alphas who are struggling, fighting against each other to try and establish a new state as quickly as possible. What I aim to achieve in my own small way is to create more people, whether they are personally leaders or followers, who agree with me that having a central organizing force with the moral authority to initiate violence in society isn't the best way to solve problems. If we can get there, if we can get enough people on that page, a significant minority of the population would be good enough. We can then form a block within whatever form of society we have at that point. The way things are going, it seems like we're going to be stuck with democracies for the foreseeable future. But uh, that works in our favor. We can form a block. Look at what Rand Paul's doing in the Senate. I talked about that in my last podcast. We could form an anarchist block the way that Rand Paul is trying to, through the Freedom Caucus, form a kind of libertarian block. And from there, if you can get in and implement anarchic solutions that work, if you could privatize education and have it be better, if you could privatize the welfare state and have it be better, these are ways that in mass we could show people that the state isn't the right way to solve these kinds of problems. Oh, and my other point about it not mattering if some people are followers. For one thing, anarchy doesn't mean no leaders. It means no rulers. So I think in a stateless society, there would be kind of voluntary leaders. Uh, so what we have as politicians today could evolve into something more like a personality cult, like they had in ancient Greece, where like Pythagoras started a school, the, the, new, the Pythagorean school of mathematics. And the people who lived there didn't just study math, they lived Pythagoras's lifestyle. I think in a stateless society, you would see institutions like that reemerge and you would have essentially politicians, but that people followed voluntarily. And some of them would be leftists, some others might not be. But the thing is, we're not limited to what I can imagine or what sticks can imagine or what any one of us could, because a free market sets loose a uh, real competition where people actually have to please each other, where problems actually have to be solved in the real world. And um, that produces all kind of crazy stuff that you, you, nobody in the 1700s could have imagined the internet. And if we are allowed to evolve, if we're allowed to speak freely, if we're allowed to compete with each other, who knows what kind of crazy stuff will come up with in the future. An anarchic society could very well be much more efficient and much more highly organized than a, sta than a state of society would. So I think there was a couple other things that he said that I wanted to address. Let me look over my notes real quick here. 
Oh, Styx is also correct. He mentions that in an anarchic society, uh, in bad times when people become desperate, they're going to attack each other because they need food or they need water or resources or whatever. Well, yeah, of course they will. But they don't not do that when we have nation states. <laughs> when people get desperate, they do desperate things. That's not going to change. That's human nature. But see, in a status society, that same kind of stuff happens. States don't prevent people from fighting one another. States turned it into an art form. States, states turned individual conflict or conflict between small groups into warfare that can involve half the population of the planet. Uh, and with, with nation states, you also have this situation where the rulers are really incentivized to trigger war because it gives them more power. It gives their friends in the big corporations ways to make money. It gives their friends in the international banks ways to make money through usury. Um, so a stateless society is still going to have violent conflicts from time to time, but without massive standing armies, funded through taxation, without the ability through a central bank to print money. I, I don't know that in a stateless society we would have world wars, or, or giant wars between huge groups of people. I, I don't know. I wouldn't think so. It's kind of funny because Styx uses phrases like stateless utopia a lot in his video. But it does seem to me that Styx kind of envisions a state utopia where the state is finally going to only be used for the things that he sh thinks it should be used for. And it'll never get co-opted by anybody else, and it'll never become corrupt. Or if it does, they'll be able to fix it really quickly. And reality has never shown us that. But in terms of through the long-term changing of culture to create generations of people that understand that status solutions to problems don't work, that is something new. That is something that nobody has ever done before. And... That's what I'm setting out to do with not just my podcast and my videos, but my books and stuff too. Because how do you change a culture? You do it with art. How did the left destroy the United States? Well, they, they had pol a political arm and they had an academic arm. But I maintain that the most crucial element of leftism that allowed them to destroy the United States was their art. Leftists are great artists and they enshrine leftist principles in art. It was primarily through movies and books and music that people became leftists slowly over time. And so I make anarchist art. I make anarchist music. I make anarchist books. And, um, you know, maybe I'll inspire two other people to do that. And in the next generation, we'll have two anarchist writers who think that way. And maybe in the generation after that, we'll have four. And maybe, hopefully, over a period of hundreds or thousands of years, we can finally evolve toward a stateless society. And then uh, they'll thank me for it. <laughs> And that's pretty much all I got on that. And if, you, if you're still listening now, you must have thought this was pretty interesting. And I really appreciate your time for one thing and for another. If you think this was a cool video, then would you do me a huge favor and tweet it or leave it in a comment for Sticks Hex and Hammer 666? Because it'd be neat if he saw it and listened and responded. Uh, that's a long shot. He's a really big fish. And although my YouTube channel is explosively successful, I think the likelihood of him paying attention to somebody with only 1,100 subscribers is pretty small, but hey, you never know. If enough people do it, it might just happen. And uh, I'd be really fascinated to talk to him. I think he's an interesting guy. But uh, other than that, I, I see that uh, Rachel Maddow's attempt to get a hold of Trump's tax returns and try and uh, make some hay with that backfired on her. He actually paid a higher tax rate than Obama did and, uh, <laughs> and a few other things. I'm just looking over. Hold on. I was looking at the headlines on Drudge. I haven't had a chance to look into it too deeply yet. This is something I was just poking around. Looking at, you know, what, what else can I throw in here to mention in the podcast? And that's something. I was a little bit worried about that. Not because I, I, I would tend to doubt there's probably nothing in Trump's tax returns that would bother me. Uh, because I would advocate, you know, if, if Trump had found some way to pay no income taxes, I would admire that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate him for it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> lefties think a little differently. And I was worried that this was going to be yet another thing and part of this death of a thousand slices that they're trying to use to delegitimize Trump and destroy his uh, presidency. But uh, I'm not even drunk. I have not uh, been getting into the Belgian beer tonight. Uh, so I don't know why I'm stumbling and starting to mispronounce words, but I think that means it's probably time to wrap up the podcast. But thank you so much for listening. I, I really do appreciate it as always. And uh, it's a harsh word out there, my friends. So please keep thinking. Bye-bye.